I'm going to begin this morning with a question. And I'm going to ask you to evaluate your prayer life, the content of your prayer life. And if you use the content of your prayer life, in other words, what things you're including in your conversations with God, how do you answer the following questions? What are you asking for? What are you seeking? And what doors are you knocking on? What are you asking for? What are you seeking? And what doors are you knocking on? I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in this morning to our text. We're in the Sermon on the Mount, nearing the end in chapter 7 of Matthew. And so if you want to go ahead, if you brought your Bible this morning, turn it to to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 7 to 11 this morning. Even though I know that might make your mind drift to Slurpees after church. But verses 7 to 11 of chapter 7. Let's go ahead and read it through this morning. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? In other words, God will grant whatever wish you ask for. God will grant whatever wish you ask for. If you want a good parking space, just ask. If you want to pass your your tests, if you want that promotion at work, if you want that dot, 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 question mark, whatever it is, fill in the blank, God will give it to you, right? God will grant every wish that you desire. Is that true? See, I signed me up too, right? But it's easy to translate it this way, isn't it? It's actually often, I've heard it taught this way before, how common and easy it is to translate this as God is our genie. Uh, This brings to mind a picture of a scene in the movie called Aladdin. Anyone here seen Aladdin? I hope most of us, we've seen that cartoon, right? Disney. And in this cartoon, there's a, a scene in which Aladdin has gone into the underground, whatever it is, treasure, in order to find this this special treasure, and he's fooled, right? And he gets by Jafar, stinking Jafar. He gets locked down underneath in the sand, right? So Aladdin, all of a sudden, the mouth closes on the entrance, and he's locked down underneath. But what's remaining is this, the lamp, what he was intending to go get, and Jafar didn't get the lamp. And so there's this awesome scene with Robin Williams uh, singing this great song as he rubs the lamp and the genie comes out, Right? I, I wanted to show the whole thing to you, but it's just a little bit too long this morning, although it would have been fun, wouldn't it? And so he rubs the lamp, and the genie comes out, and what does he get? He gets three wishes, any three wishes he desires. It's so easy if we aren't careful to read the Scripture and to start thinking of God and treating God this way, but this text is not telling us God will grant every wish that we want or ask for. Um, it's not to say these things that we want in terms of whether it's um, anyway, it's not to say God doesn't want us to ask for certain things, but this, this text is not saying that God was going to, if we ask for whatever we want, we're going to get it. If we seek anything in life, then we're going to get that. Uh, I've actually wondered before, what would our prayer lives look like if God simply provided everything we asked for? What would our prayer lives look like if, if God gave us everything? If we, got, if we got in prayer anything we asked for, we'd probably pray a lot more, wouldn't we? Wouldn't you? If you could get whatever you asked for, wouldn't you be praying probably on a daily basis? I think probably I'd pray for some very different things than I typically do pray for now if this was what I understood and who I understood God to be and what prayer to be. I'd probably pray for some money since that's lacking. Uh, I'd probably pray for some success, right? What, ha- what happens when Aladdin or anybody in any movie ever brings a genie out of the lamp? They get three wishes problem with understanding prayer this way is that the purpose of prayer in our lives soon becomes our own selfish desires and gain. Is this the purpose of prayer? Is this why God calls us throughout Scripture to prayer? Is for us to be able to pursue our selfish desires, our selfish gain? Or, uh, you know, is the purpose of prayer the uniting of God to our will? 
is the purpose of prayer uniting God to our will. It often seems this way. Give me this. I want this. I have this planned. God, can you make this work out here for me? Sometimes I've had to stop myself in prayer wondering why I'm trying to convince God why he should adhere adhere to my plans. I've had to stop God in the midst of trying to convince him, you know, just like I do with anyone maybe, of why he should adhere to my plans. Is this God's desire? Is this what God wants? Um, or is the greater purpose of prayer the surrender of our will for the sake of God's will and the declaration of our desires which are born out of our devotion to God? I'll, I'll state that again. The greater purpose of prayer is the surrender of our will to this, for the sake of God's will and the declaration of our desires which are born out of our devotion to to God, and so it's a very different nature to prayer. The prayer in Scripture, the prayer we're called to, the prayer that we practice as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And so this is not what this text means. God will not grant every wish that we desire. Shoot, hey? Um, Okay, but as long as we're asking for good things, right? As long as we ask for good things or things that aren't bad for us, then God will certainly give those to us, right? This this Scripture is telling us, be fervent. As long as you're asking for good things, God's going to give those things to you. Is this, is this the case? Is this the case just from your own experience in, in prayer? If this is true, I'll ask a really difficult question, maybe a question that sounds strange for a preacher to ask on a Sunday morning. Why doesn't God answer all of our prayers? Anyone who has prayed for very long has experienced the struggle with understanding seemingly unanswered prayer, right? Right? Why doesn't God answer all of my prayers? What about the clearly good things we're asking for? Healing, health, love, resolution. Why doesn't God answer these? Um, I maybe shouldn't even raise the question because I'm not going to sufficiently answer it for you uh, this morning. I do believe there are answers to this question and very sufficient answers. Uh, answers to this question, but I'll stick to the direction of what I believe this text is teaching us this morning or going, which is to simply share my belief that this text is not intended to mean that God will give us anything we ask for. This text is not saying, as long as things, you're, the things you're asking for are good, God's going to go ahead and answer that this isn't prayer. Uh, prayer is not God giving us whatever we ask for. I will say this, that I do believe most seemingly unanswered prayer, and I really emphasize seemingly unanswered uh, from my own personal experience, uh, it can be explained by two things. So I'll try to at least answer this question in part, although again, it won't be sufficient. But number one is God's perspective of timing is different than ours. This is something that I've come to understand and have really, it's, it's kind of annoying to even have that told to you, right? When you're sitting and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and God hasn't answered your prayer. This isn't what you want to be told, but it's the truth. If we look at God, if we look through, at God throughout Scripture, God's perspective of timing is much different than ours. Of course, we have an eternal God that's probably to be expected, right? Um, Nicky Gumbel uh, said this. He said, Joseph waited 13 years. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited 40 years. And Jesus waited 30 years. If God makes you wait, you are in very good company, Right? If God makes you wait, you're in very good company. How often do we lament unanswered prayer while still being in the midst of receiving our answer? I often think about this in regards to how God does things and why he does things. And and it's really hard to wrap my mind around because we live in this immediate gratification culture. If we want something, we want it right now. And if it takes too long, then it's not worth waiting for. It's not worth having. It's not worth seeking or pursuing. We don't want to earn anything. We want it all handed to us. Our whole life, our whole culture, our world is, is heading in the direction of trying to make everything as quick and easy as we can possibly make it. How do you make money with a new product in today's world? You make something easier. You make something quicker. And so we are headed in this direction that's very different from an eternal God who calls us to an eternity with him. His perspective of timing is much different than ours. Uh, Number two is God's knowledge of good gifts is much different than our knowledge of good gifts. Of course, an all-knowing, infinite God would hopefully know, have a little bit more knowledge and wisdom, right, than me or hopefully more specially than you. I'm just kidding. (laughs) 
We have an all-knowing and infinite, uh, eternal God. His understanding, His knowledge of good gifts is much different than our knowledge of good gifts. And often, I think when we're, we're sitting there waiting for an unanswered prayer, it's been answered differently. It's being answered still differently. Maybe it's not answered because what we think is a good gift is really not a good gift at all. I think just like a children who uh, wants to eat candy for supper, many of the things we think we need or will find joy in in life are not necessarily the case. And I can tell you with very conf- confident assurance that throughout my life, God has saved me from the things I thought I might find joy in. Most often, I believe our greatest concern and content is prayer. and prayer is related to what we have, right? When we pray for things and we think, well, what am I going to pray for? What do I need to bring before God? We're, we're usually thinking, even in regards to people, friendships, we, we're always thinking about things we have, right? Uh, so we're thinking of material objects uh, or at least physical objects, physically having things. But throughout Scripture and throughout this entire Sermon on the Mount, we learn that God's greatest concern is with who we are on the inside, rather than what we have. And so when our prayer lives are consumed with things that we have, it makes sense that there would be some sort of different understanding on God's part in regards to what is really, truly a good gift, what is truly good for us. And I think God's greater concern always with all of us as His followers is who we are, who we are being made into, not necessarily what we have. Often when we question God's provision or presence for unanswered prayer, It isn't because of God's lack of provision. That's not the culprit. But the difference between God's understanding and timing and our understanding and timing. There's my insufficient answer to that question this morning. Um, If you'd like to talk further about that, I'd love to do that. I literally would love to have coffee and to dig deeper into that great question. Uh, But I'll just leave it at this this morning. Jesus is not telling us in this text uh, that God will give us the gifts that we determine to be good but the gifts that our Father determines to be good. There's emphasis on that. Jesus is also not telling us answers will come immediately as much as we'd really love that to happen. So what exactly is Jesus saying here? Let's get into that. Let's review the context and content of the Sermon on the Mount. So literary context. We're reading a small scripture. Uh, I don't think anyone really likes to be taken out of context, right? Take one little thing you say. It's pretty popular today to do that in news, right? Um, take one little thing you say. We don't want to do that to Jesus, of course. We don't want to do that ever with Scripture. We want to look at the context. So where do we find this, these uh, verses here this morning in the Sermon on the Mount, this great teaching of Jesus, this extended um, length of Jesus' teaching? And also, I'll, I'll just review as quickly as I can this morning what he's been speaking on to this point uh, as we've been speaking all su- or reading and hearing this all summer, he begins by talking about happiness, true happiness. And in fact, he begins talking about happiness in the kingdom and he paints this really upside down picture of happiness and how we find joy. Who's really blessed? Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted. It's a really different way of looking at happiness and true joy. And apparently within the kingdom, there's this very different joy we find. It's a deeper joy. It's something much different than what we perceive to be true happiness or true joy. Uh, he talks about influence as his, as his children, as citizens of God's kingdom. He says we are to be salt and to be light in this world. What does he mean by that? Quickest way I can say that is we, he wants us to be influential, to be changing, to be improving everywhere we are. This is what he wants his church to be, salt and light in the world, influence and to change where we are. Uh, he calls us to righteousness in a significant way. Unless our righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He paints a different picture and a deeper picture, a fulfilled picture of the law. You've heard that it was said, do not murder. I say, do not hate your brother. You've heard that it said, do not divorce. He calls us to faithfulness in marriage. You've heard that it's said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. I call you to love your enemies. <laughs> calls us to a true righteousness. Be perfect as your Father is perfect, he says. He calls us to purity of heart in the practice of our faith. Purity of heart in the practice of our faith. Not being motivated by our, our personal praise uh, or acknowledgement from others, but to be motivated by our love for God. He warns us against that. So purity of heart in the practice of our faith. And last week we looked at judgment 
any importance in regards to making judgments. Again, we looked last week and not necessarily not judging, but, but not judging harshly, not judging in a way that is harmful. And to judge in light of grace, right? We live and exist within this whole ocean of grace as God's church, as Jesus' followers. And so in our judgments and our discernments, those are all looked at through the lens of grace and approached through the lens of grace. And as I said last week, I opened last week saying this, my, you know, I, I started saying this is the greatest sermon ever, ever told. But I'm starting to think after going through this and digging deeper into this, this might be the worst sermon ever told. And I only say that out of my selfishness, out of the difficulty Jesus calls us to. It's so challenging, right? What do we want to hear? We want to hear people tell us what we want to hear, Right? We want to be told we're doing really good, <laughs> and uh, we're right where we need to be. We don't, often as people, it kind of, it irks us. Hopefully as Christians, we, we love it, and we're, we seek that, and we desire it. We want to be challenged. We want to grow. We want to be called further and deeper into our faith. That, that's why I jokingly say this may be the worst, because Jesus is, um, it's all so hard. And the fact is that most of what Jesus calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount is impossible. It's not possible for us to achieve this. He, he, he paints a picture of living in the kingdom of God that is impossible for us to achieve. We cannot be perfect as our Father is perfect, this righteousness, apart from Christ, <laughs> apart from Jesus Christ. What Jesus is calling us to through the Sermon on the Mount is to Him, is to this kingdom in which we exist and we live and we have an open doorway through Jesus Christ to live and to exist and we can seek this amazing life that Jesus paints a picture of. Be part of this amazing kingdom that God is, Jesus is painting a picture of. So Jesus has been detailing what life in the kingdom looks like, and he now turns us toward the way in which we can achieve this life. He turns us toward prayer. He turns us toward our Father. God will provide all that is needed to live this kingdom life. When Jesus turns and he says, ask and you will receive, Seek and you will find, knock, and the door will be opened to you. He is turning us to our Father in heaven. In regards to everything He has um, called us to, we are to turn to prayer. Let's go ahead and we'll read it, read it again, verses 7 and 8 again, in light of this context in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he turns now and He says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Jesus isn't referring here to anything in general, but rather to all that he has called us to in this great sermon. Ask, seek, and knock as you pursue happiness. God will provide it. Ask, seek, and knock as you pursue influence in this world to be salt and light. God will provide that. Ask, seek, and knock as you pursue this holy righteousness. And God will provide that. Ask, seek, and knock as you attempt to love your enemies. Ask, seek, and knock as you pursue strength in your marriage. Ask, seek, and knock as you pursue, pursue purity of heart and the practice of your faith. God will provide that. Ask, seek, and knock as you struggle to filter your judgment and discernment through the lens of grace. And God will provide that. You cannot do it on your own. Turn to God. He is the solution and He is the source of kingdom life. Uh, there's great peace in this, isn't there? We don't have to do it all. There's great peace, I find, in knowing that it's only through Jesus Christ, it's only through the grace offered in Jesus and the provision of the Holy Spirit that I can truly be transformed, that I can truly live this, this life. I'm so glad that I don't, it's not about my achievements, about my abilities. It's not about my persistence and my drive. If I just try hard enough, I'll be holy enough. If I just try hard enough, I'll be saved enough. There's also great sorrow in this because in order to reach this, we have to surrender control. And so we have to surrender control. I don't know which is harder. Jesus is calling us to kingdom life and he's now calling us to prayer in order to live this kingdom life. But will, will God really provide? It's really easy to doubt, isn't it? I don't know about you, but as I look at myself and my imperfection and my struggles still with sin, as I look at where I've been, who I still am, it's easy to doubt God's ability to really transform us, to really turn us into a citizen of His 
his kingdom. So let's read 9, 9 through 11 again. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Uh, Jesus uses, uh, I believe, another humorous, humorous example here. Just in the previous text, he's used an example of, don't take, why would you take a speck of sawdust out of your brother's eye when you still have a log in your, your own eye? Uh, there's a little bit of humor in what Jesus says here. If your child asks for a for some bread, why would you, you wouldn't give him a stone? If he asked for a fish, you wouldn't give him uh, a, sn- a snake. There's almost a tone of sarcasm in this example he uses. But Jesus uses the love and provision that parents give their children as an example of God's ability to love and provide. He says, whoever asks will receive, whoever seeks will find, and whoever knocks, the door will be opened to them. And then he, uh, he compares, sorry, he doesn't compare to the love of parents, but he contrasts with the love that parents provide their children. Now, let's just consider for a second the love and provision of parents. What do, what do parents provide to their children? The love that they have for their children. I, know, I don't know about you as parents, but I would die for my children. The devotion of, uh, that you have for your children is, um, is incredible. But just in general, what do we do? We provide for our children, right? We, we provide for our children what is good. We give them food, we give them water, they need those to live, right? What do we do as parents? We want, to have, we want to have a place for them to live, to raise our children. So we focus on providing housing for them. We want them to be in school, to get an education. So we, we search and we decide what is best for our ch- children in terms of school, you know, activities. For, we want them to develop skills and teamwork, and so we put them into these different things. We want them to have friends, right? We want our children to have friends and to be accepted, and so we work towards these as parents. We want our children to know God. And so what do we do? We raise them to know God and to understand Him, to know Him. Um, we also, apart from providing what is good for our children, we, what do we do? We avoid what is bad, right? Um, I had a, just on Friday, I'm three days in my 10 days, although I'm cheating because I have grandparents here for the last day and a half, but... On Friday, I was still on my own. Chelsea and my daughter, my wife and daughter are in Haiti, and I'm on my own with three kids. Um, and so on, I've realized you, you almost got to, I have to set a schedule. So I realized when kids get hungry that they get a little bit grumpy. So Friday, I had forgotten to feed kids lunch, <laughs> which it's okay because the alarm bell is usually when they start screaming at each other and uh, realizing, oh, they're probably hungry. So I, I made them some chicken nuggets and some fries late on, well, it wasn't too late, but it was about 2 o'clock on uh, Friday afternoon. And just like, like usual, like you'd expect, my two-year-old daughter, Eleanor, is, uh, in order to keep her happy if she's hungry, I'm having her help me. And uh, once these chicken nuggets, everyone's starving, it's taking forever for them to cook, right? And so, so I'm letting her watch. She's literally standing there almost the whole time watching them cook through the oven window. And we pull them out, and then what happens? As soon as they're out of the oven, they've been cooking in there for 300, she wants to eat them, right? And so she reaches for them, and I quickly saved her life. <laughs> Hero dad. Took her arm away. And then, of course, what does she do as a two-year-old? She doesn't understand. She wants to eat. Why won't you let me eat? I want to eat. I need to eat. I'm starving, dad. All of the boys started too. We're starving, dad. Give us some food. But I had to keep them away from the food. With Eleanor, I literally had to like barricade the <laughs> her away from the hot pan and the hot food. She wanted it desperately. And so we protect our kids from what is bad, right? This is the love of parents. It's great. I realize this isn't always the love of parents. Not everyone has experienced this. But this is what Jesus is talking about. This kind of devotion, this love, this care, this provision that parents provide for their, for their children. As mine is right here. <laughs> um, but as much as the love of a parent drives us to provide what is needed for our children, our love also compels us to deter our children from what they may want and may harm them. Uh, But notice here Jesus' description of parents. I don't know if you notice this, the significance of this. He says, though you are evil. Though you are evil. What What is Jesus talking about here? He's calling me evil? He says, though though you are evil. Jesus doesn't mean here, at least maybe not in the... um, shallow sense, you know, any sort of extreme way evil that we might think of in regards to cartoons or movies these days were evil villains trying to destroy the world. 
but maybe something a little bit deeper and, um, and even greater than that, though you are evil. What Jesus says here really goes along with what t- Scripture teaches us, right? What Paul teaches us, Colossians 2.13, we are all dead in our sins. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short. Jesus here is, is noting the nature of humanity, of all of us. We, are, we have sinned, we, have, we fall short of the glory of God. We are all flawed, of course, we, all, we understand this. As Christians, this is what turns us to Jesus. I've often heard the importance of not judging God based on bad fathers, which I believe is a very good teaching. But here we learn that it's likely best to not judge God based on good fathers either. All fathers are imperfect and fallen and captive to sin. This is significant to understand. (laughs) Regardless of what we just talked about, the devotion, the love that parents have for their children, Jesus is saying, just imagine. He says the distance between good and bad fathers here on earth is nothing compared to the distance between all earthly fathers and your Father in heaven. The distance between good and bad fathers here on earth is nothing compared to the distance between all earthly fathers and God. Whether we have or whether we had, hello dear. (laughs) How about you go see grandma? Yeah, Yeah? okay. (laughs) Uh, So whether we have and we had, I mentioned before that not everybody has had this experience of having a parent like this. Uh, But whether we have or we haven't, a good father or a bad father here on earth, we all have a heavenly father. Sorry, I don't want you to miss this. (laughs) Hey, I love you. Can you go outside? Hey, go see, go find grandma. Maybe grandpa will take you outside. (laughs) All right. Could you maybe come get her? Kim, thank you. (laughs) <laughs> although it probably would just be as entertaining here to, to watch her for a while but I'll continue I wanted to make sure that you heard this and that I uh, made sure this was clear whether you have had a good father or you had a good father or whether you had a bad father or you have a bad father we all have a heavenly father who is infinitely good and pure and whose love and provision is available to all Regardless of what experience of fatherhood we've had here on earth, we all have a heavenly Father who's infinitely good and pure and whose love and provision is available to all. And so the question isn't, will God provide? The question is, will we allow Him to? Will we ask for, seek, and knock on the door of the things that He knows we are in desperate need of? Will we become His child and trust our Father? Jesus is calling us to ask for and to seek and to knock on the door of the pursuit of this kingdom life. To turn to God, turn to our Father, and He will provide for us. I started with a question, and I'm going to end with that this morning. I asked you to consider your prayer life and the content of your prayer, what you typically pray for, and, and to just evaluate based on that, what is it you're asking for? What is it that you are seeking And what doors are you knocking on? Uh, I believe the content of our prayers are often a reliable source for determining where our hearts truly lie. Whatever we're praying for is wherever our heart is. What does your prayer life tell you about the direction of your heart? Is it toward God and His glory? Or toward your your pursuits and your glory? Uh, Jesus here calls us to prayer as a source for pursuing the kingdom life. Jesus calls us in this great sermon to a life that has lived in unity with God for the purposes of God as the children of God. Above all, this text today is an encouragement for us to turn to prayer in our pursuit of this kingdom life. Above all, Jesus wants to ensure here that we do not look to ourselves as the solution or the source for this kingdom life. God, our Father, is the solution. God, our Father, is the source. And God, our Father, will provide Uh, He will provide. I'll just say it one more time. I want you to leave with this ringing in your ears. He will provide. I don't know about you.
But it's not an easy thing, is it? To live the surrendered life. To walk through the world that we live in today, to navigate our way through that faithful, righteous, holy, set apart, being salt and being light, being, finding joy in the most dire circumstances. It's all a very pretty, beautiful picture. And it's things I've tasted, but sometimes struggle to see, to experience. I want to encourage you this morning, if that's you, if you're struggling to, to really experience the joy that Christ says that we get to experience when we're living for Him. If you're, if you're struggling to, to feel like you're succeeding in any way as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you continually are feeling like you are a failure, I want to encourage you, if I, can, I can't solve your problem, I can't fix everything for you, and I can't take your hand and lead you directly to exactly where you need to go, but God can. And so what I want to do this morning is just to make sure that you hear this. Turn to God. Turn to prayer. If you're praying for anything, forget about everything else and pray for this. Pray for the holy life. Pray to become a citizen of God's kingdom. Pray for transformation. Pray for God to lead you and to give you the strength to make the decisions you need and to be the person who you need to be. It's the only way you'll ever achieve it. You cannot earn this. You cannot earn this. You cannot do enough. You'll never do enough to be saved. You'll never do enough to achieve this holiness and righteousness that God wants to lead us towards. God and His Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ is the only way to achieve this. Turn to God. Turn to prayer. If anything, Jesus is beckoning us this morning to prayer. Not simply to be with God, but to prayer because it's the only way that we can become who He truly wants us to be, to live the life He truly wants us to live. And so again, I'll just continue to say this. Pray, pray. And I'll just end with this, the same words Jesus uses. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Whoever asks will receive and whoever uh, seeks will find and whoever knocks, the door will be opened to them. Let's turn to God in prayer in this great pursuit of kingdom life. We'll close doing that right now if you'll join me.